So we're going to talk about gratitude tonight. And that's a fun topic for me because I, I try to be grateful in all I do. Um, we talk a lot in gra about gratitude in our Celebrate Recovery program. It's important. It's important to be grateful. Even when situations don't seem so good, it's important to be grateful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Be thankful in all circumstances. Say all. all. All circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, we belong to Christ Jesus, right? We're his. So if it's his will for us to be thankful in all circumstances, do you think Paul was thankful when he was in prison shackled? Yeah, he was. He may not have been happy about it, but he had joy. He had joy, and that's why so many miracles happen. We don't have to be happy necessarily about the situations we find ourselves in because the Bible says we're going to find ourselves in some situations that are going to cause us trouble on this side of heaven. But how we react and what we do internally with that is very much up to us. I have control of the way I see something, the way I perceive something, and what I'm going to do about it for the most part. We live in a wrecked world, politically, emotionally, family-wise, mentally. All these things are a mess in our world, right? We don't have to live with a wrecked attitude, though. Un what? OK. Ungratefulness will sabotage, it will strangle the full life that Jesus promises us, beginning with being grateful, and you will be full. It's hard not to see that we live in a broken and wrecked world. God told us that this would happen. It's one heck of a thing for God to tell us, right? Your world's going to be messed up, guys. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12, sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. He said that as the end draws near because of lawlessness and increased love of many will grow cold. Have you seen that out there? It's very obvious we live in this wrecked world, wrecked marriages, things being called marriage that aren't marriage, wrecked homes, wrecked economy. Oh man, the economy is on a roller coaster right now. Have you watched the Dow Jones? It's been crazy this past week. I don't really pay attention to stocks that much. My 401k is the only thing that I'm afraid to look at it now. But, I mean, just look at it. And like, if I swipe over on my, my um, iPhone and I see, it's like down 900 points. That's not good. But one of the main things that can sabotage us and strangle full life out of us is an attitude of ungratefulness. You see, like I said, we choose how we respond to things around us. I could be very upset about my 401k going in the toilet, or I could be grateful that there's something there for when I retire, and that there is indeed something there, and that I have a job right now that is paying our bills and that provides for us and we're able to bless others. You see the difference? I know a lot of people who are real panicked about their 401k and they're 30 years old. It's not good what's going on right now. I'm not saying that. But look around at what you do have. Dr. Adrian Rogers said, God's will is what we would want for ourselves if we were smart enough to want it. You see, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 clearly tells us right attitude we should have in the wrecked world. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. That is the attitude we're supposed to have in this messed up world we live in. You know, if we could see things the way God sees things, and, and we, we can't, we don't have God eyes, we would see beyond the circumstances that are going on right now. Because you see, God, he has millennial, eternal, infinite eyes that sees from here all the way to the end, and there is no end of time. And our life right now is but a vapor. We don't, what we're living now isn't in any comparison to where we're going to be. But we have to make 
the most of what we have now and be about God's business. Gratitude is seeing that God is good. Well, I know some people will say God is not good. They've had hurt in their life or something like that, and they'll say God is not good. Gratitude comes, though, from a clear vision of who God is. The devil has always been trying to destroy God's character. Psalm 100, shout, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and faithfulness continues to each generation. Boy, that is a lot packed into one psalm. And it says, when I inserted it into my computer here, it says a psalm of thanksgiving different kinds of psalms. There's some psalms of lament. There's some just desperate cries to God. But this is one of those that's a psalm of thanksgiving. You could almost write a worship song to this. They did. <laughs> a, a chorus, you know. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. I don't even, okay, we'll have to sing it sometime. I'm not going to try. I play the piano. She sings. Um, Life is full of joy, peaceful, powerful, purpose, useful, and faithful. The, de the devil wants to destroy that. If you have any of those things, joy, peace, purpose, any of that stuff, the devil wants to destroy it. He wants to come after it. Satan wants you to have a life that is ungrateful. Because if you're ungrateful, you're not living the way God wants you to live. The devil wants you to think Poor me. Man, if I only had what that person had, or if I only did what that person did, the devil knows when you ignore God's will of thankfulness, it will lead to darkness and destruction. He knows it. He's seen enough people do it. He's prompted enough people to do it. And we, as his children, living in the times we're in, we have to be different. We have to shout with joy. It's okay to shout with joy. Worship the Lord with gladness. Be happy when you're worshiping. You can have a worshipful attitude like the songs we had tonight and be happy. Be happy that you have a God that loves you, that lets you worship him, that doesn't condemn you. It says in the psalm, acknowledge the Lord is God. We need to do that, man. We have got to tell him how good he is. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And, you know, we're not literally entering gates right now, but what we're saying is it could be interpreted here. Enter his church with thanksgiving in your heart, his courts around this place with praise. Be happy to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. If you're grateful, guess what your kids are going to be? Guess what your grandkids are going to be? But if you're a sourpuss, guess what your kids are going to be? Guess what your grandkids are going to be? I may, may have learned this the hard way with my kids. Um, Romans 18.21 But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks, and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. That says a lot. God gets angry about this because it says they know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. These people out there that say there is no God, they know there is a God. My best friend Dave, when he was an atheist, he will tell you, even as an atheist, he knew there was something there. 
The problem is people are trying to fill that God-sized hole with everything but God. Drugs, alcohol, sex, I could keep going on. They try to fill that God-sized hole, and that God-sized hole is there because creation cries out to God, and our bodies, our beings, our souls knows there's a God. We know there is. It says here, we don't even have an excuse saying we don't know God. People say, well, what about those people that don't know God? Do they go to heaven or hell? Do you believe God's word? It says they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now, some cool things I've heard. Muslims seeing Jesus in visions, dreams, aboriginal colonies, that when they find the colonies, they're worshiping Jesus. They had no way of knowing him, but they knew him. We've seen everything God made, and it says we can clearly see his invisible qualities. God's an artist. Have you ever seen the sky, beautiful sunset? He's an artist. We know these qualities about God. God values beauty. Being out in nature, my brother's in Utah right now, and he sends some of the most awesome pictures just of rock formations and waterfalls, and you just see God's beauty in all of that. We couldn't just happenstance have this. The human body is beautiful. Just the intricacies in the eye alone are mind-boggling, to say nothing about the human brain. We have seen his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. But seeing that, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give thanks. Do you know some unthankful people? They begin to think of all kinds of foolish ideas of what God is like. And how many of you guys have seen those foolish ideas? People carrying around crystals, putting crystals around their necks, having little dream catchers or whatever. That's what that means, making up all kinds of foolish ideas about what God is. I've heard our old next-door neighbor, she, She's so confused about things, and she was a Christian, and she's, she's like, you know, there's a whole lot of different ways to get to God. I hear that all the time. There's different ways to get to God. The Bible says there's one way. I believe the Bible. There's one way, and his name's Jesus, and it isn't some shiny crystal. That crystal may be pretty. I like rocks. I like, I like crystal rocks, amethyst, and all that stuff, but that stuff has no power. There's no power in it. There is power in the name of Jesus. It goes on to say, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Sound familiar? So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's body. Go down to verse 28. Since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, gossip. They are backstabbers, hatred, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires those who do these things to deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them. How many of you are seeing that out there? It's crazy. It's right here. And you know the sins that it lists? Greed. Well, it's really that bad to have a little greed? Envy, huh, I'm not, murder, that's bad. But what does the Bible say about murder? If you hate someone, right? Quarreling, deception. Well, I'm just, I'm going to tell him this thing, and it's really this, but I'm going to tell him this. Gossip, ooh. You see, and it also said, I, I thought it, I thought it interesting. They invent new ways of sinning. Who would think that you could invent a new way of sinning? Yet we've seen it in the past several years, haven't we? 
stuff that's never been done before, all of a sudden is coming into common practice. It's crazy. It says they disobeyed their parents. There comes a lot from that. There's a lot in that message about disobeying your parents there. Because as parents, we have to raise up our kids to love the Lord. And when they disobey, it's not always only their fault. If we don't show them Jesus every single day, and I thank God my kids follow Jesus, they... You know, my son, he'll be a little goober sometimes, and he'll give me trouble, but he's not a disobedient kid at all. And I thank God for that because, you know, it's listen here. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. You could skip over that whole message, yet you could write a whole sermon right on that. God turned them over to their ungrateful desires. God is good enough and loves you enough to turn you over to what you worship. Now, if it's not him, he'll still turn you over to it. There's a non-believer study on the internet called 31 Benefits of Gratitude, and I have the link if you want. Two of the things that this person discovered were that gratitude makes you happier and healthier. Church, God wants to give you a full life. Now, I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about prosperity gospel. He wants to give you a full life, and that full life may be living on very little, but you could have a full life on very little. Amen? Quote, a five-minute-a-day gratitude journal can increase your long-term well-being by more than 10%. That's an amazing impact. That's the same as like doubling your income. Five minutes a day, gratitude journal. Now, I told you we talked to people in CR about this, Celebrate Recovery. And we encourage them to keep a list of things they're grateful for, to do a gratitude journal every day. And we do that because when you have a grateful heart, when you're grateful about things, it's just much easier to walk down the road you need to walk down. Because you're going to see that although things may be bad, Things could be worse, and I'm grateful that they aren't. Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 86, 5, for you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive. Rich, faithful, and love to all call on you. Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all that he made. Lamentations 3, 25, the Lord is good to those who wait on him, to the person who seeks him. Nahum 1, 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the theme through all these. God is a good God. There are many things that, that are designed by the devil to distract us from the graciousness of God, but we have to cultivate a mindset of looking at God's goodness in the mess of our lives. Because our lives can be kind of messy. Remember, all things are not good. However, God makes all things work to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You may have a really, really cruddy situation going on, but God can use that situation for something good. We may not understand why we're in the season we're in, and that season may seem hard and rough, but God can use it for good. Gratitude is sharing the Lord with witness. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus Christ a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. According to the writer of Hebrews, thanksgiving or gratefulness is a fruit. Fruit of any sort requires cultivation and fertilization to produce fully. There must be some nasty things you have to walk through in order to have your fruit of thanksgiving fully fertilized. A grateful attitude doesn't happen by accident. Giving thanks in this passage is the present imperative, which means it's like a habit of attitude in action. A habit of of attitude in action. I have a habit of being grateful. God knows this will benefit us. It'll benefit others. 
and calls us to be disciplined and making it part of our daily routine. How many people like to be around somebody who's just really an ungrateful sourpuss? I don't like being around them. You know, if we make this part of our day, if we make this part of our daily habit and action, and it has to become a habit. It has to be something you do every day. Because habits are patterns. You can get in the habit of doing something. I, for too long, got in the habit of eating Reese's peanut butter cups every day. Now I'm having to work that off. A habit is something you do continually and continually. It could be a bad thing or a good thing. An attitude of gratitude, developing that every day, despite what's going on, despite the pains you're having, my back is killing me tonight, but I thank God that it's not something worse because it could be something worse. Robert's at home tonight, and he feels like crud, man. We need to be praying for him. We're going to pray for him after we're done here. My low back doesn't seem so much in compared to that. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Robert spent the past two days in emergency rooms. Not fun. The emergency <laughs> rooms are not a fun place to be right now. Acts 1 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What does a witness do? A witness tells about what they have seen and heard. We're called of God to offer a sacrifice of sharing the good things God has done in our lives. We should be telling people about the good things God has done in our lives, witnessing about that. You know, witnessing isn't necessarily walking up to somebody with a track and telling them all about salvation right out the gate. Witnessing may be walking up to that person and just telling them what God's done for you, how God's rescued you, how God saved your soul. Tell them of the good things, his mercy in your life, things that wouldn't be right if he wasn't there. Because, oh, I don't want to walk a day without God in my life. Because if I can mess it up this much of my own, how much more am I going to mess it up without God? You need him every day. Has God done anything good in your life this week? Share it with someone. Share it. Share it with somebody in here tonight. Give somebody a testimony of what God's done for you. And gratitude is serving the Lord with gladness. It says, Psalm 102, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. You see, that attitude of gratitude comes with being glad, comes with being joyful, and like I said, joyful doesn't mean you're necessarily happy all the time, but you can tell when a person has joy despite their situation. Serving God isn't dry and boring. When you get your sight right, there's joy, laughter, at seeing God's goodness take root in other people's lives. I love seeing God work in other people's lives. That's why I love Celebrate Recovery so much, because I see God work in people's lives that are messed up, and they finally yield to God and Boom, things are changing. You can't serve God with grumbling activity. You know, we have that example with the Israelites, right? Exodus 16, 12, I have heard the Israelites' complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you will take meat to eat, and in the morning you will have all the bread you want, and then you will know I am the Lord your God. They were complaining about their food. God gave them an answer. In Numbers 11.1, 1, soon the people began to complain about their hardship, and the Lord heard everything they said. He hears your complaining. Then the Lord's anger blazed against them. He sent fire to rage among them, and he destroyed some of the people in the outskirts of the camp. God doesn't like complaining, y'all. Thank God he hasn't destroyed me and mine. 
Philippians 2, 14 through 15, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Do everything without complaining and arguing because complaining will lead to arguing. You don't want people to be able to criticize you, right? You want to have an innocent life as a child of God. I told you this morning about that Facebook post I made. Someone was able to criticize me over that. It was truthful. The content was accurate. But the heart behind it was argumentative. So someone was able to criticize. It says right here, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. If we shut out every light in this room and put blackout curtains on all the curtains, one single candle would light up the whole room. It wouldn't be bright, but there'd be light. You've been to Christmas Eve services where they do that, and they candle to candle to candle, and silent night sung. And before long, the whole room is bright with candles because it takes one heart on fire for God, one person with an attitude of gratitude, and it spreads. It spreads to other people. So you can choose what to spread. You can spread negativity. You can spread contempt. You can spread um, bitterness. Or you can spread joy. How many of you know the world needs more joy right now? Ungrateful complainers are lumped in there with idolaters, sexually immoral, and those desiring evil. They're lumped right in there. Life is a gift for God, and it's to be lived for God. When our mouths are full of thankfulness, they can't be full of grumbling. Amen? You can serve God with grateful activity. The things you do, the things we do, that's why I'm so big on let's get out and do something for the community this summer, this fall. Let's do something, and let's let people know we're here. And let's not do it for our benefit. Let's do it for the benefit of others so they can say, people at that Meadowbrook church, man, they're, they're joyful people. There's something different about them. The Bible calls us a peculiar, peculiar, I can't even say the word, people, strange people. Thank you. It's strange to have gratitude in the world today. People think they have a right to gripe and moan and complain. Well, I have a right to do this. Look at all this stuff happening to me. Church, we need to be different. We need to be strange and be out there and be showing the love of Christ to everyone. Make it part of your prayer life. Make your gratitude list part of your prayer life. Sing songs of thanksgiving to God. I sing by myself. <laughs> I, uh, but sometimes I can get lost in playing my piano. So I have a friend from, uh, from Canada that sends me different songs and stuff that he plays and records, and he sent me one. And I opened it up today, and me and Nicole were listening to it, and his kids were singing too. It was just the cutest thing. And I told him, I'm like, Paul, that is so adorable, man. He's like, I love it that my kids know obscure worship songs. That they don't know, like, you know, it's not just the mainline stuff. When I sit here and I play my guitar and I'm, and I'm playing something that maybe somebody hasn't heard, they've heard enough praise and worship in our house to be able to sing along and worship God with me. Thank those that do the smallest act in your life. If someone does something for you, tell them thank you. I don't care how small it is. And serve God and serve others. Jesus was a servant. Jesus was a servant. He served other people. That's what we should do. Charles Spurgeon said, it's not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this time we've had together, Lord, and I thank you for each person in this room. 
God, I pray that each person in this room would have an attitude of gratitude every day. God, that we would walk around carrying you as a as a wonderful scent on us, that we would not put people off, that we would not be be a bitter people, but God, people would see us and they'd be like, there's something different with that person. God, help us all have that attitude of gratitude every day. In your name I pray. Amen.